all the stuff that I'm going to throw on the screen right now is going to be pretty useful stuff to like think a little bit further about rather than me just rattling it off to you guys. So the problems I'm seeing so far with the reading response entries and the Canvas group discussion on free speech, not everyone is doing this wrong, but I am noticing like the, the major issue that people are having is that they're actually misunderstanding the points from each of the readings. And I think this is happening because people are reading it pretty quickly or maybe not reading the whole thing through. And the difference between these articles and the ones that we've read so far is that they are heavily dealing with an opposing side, whereas the articles that we've read in the past have mainly been focusing on one trajectory with minor opposition that they might bring up at one point, but the argument isn't revolving around dealing with an opposition. So this is the problem that you get here when you're not really reading it too carefully. So in this case, you may think the writer is making their own point, but they're actually bringing up the opposition or they are bringing up a problem with the opposition that they're going to develop over multiple paragraphs. And this is the kind of thing that you're going to start seeing that rather than making like three small points uh, that you guys used to do in high school, it's, it's a larger complicated point that your whole essay is revolving around just proving one point that takes multiple paragraphs to flesh out. So when you're reading it from one of the articles, if you're going to understand what they're saying, you have to understand it in its context. So to understand the part, the paragraph here, you have to understand the whole. And that's going to get even worse with the next two readings that we cover. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Also, I want you guys to try to think ahead while you guys are going through these readings so that you don't have to go back and reread stuff. First, understand the point. But then second, once you've understood what's being said, find the strongest points from the opposition. Like if you find a really strong point, but you're still in disagreement with it, that's the kind of part that you want to argue against in your essay. So be thinking about, okay, this is a strong point from the side that I'm against. I'm going to go with this. And then you can write a whole essay around that. If it's, if it's a strong point from the opposition, that's what I'm looking for for you to argue against. And likewise, that's what you want to look for because that gives you something that's so complicated that you have to write a full essay around it. And we'll talk about some of the ones that you've already covered in the reading so far. There's two things that we'll end up looking at. So just remember, we're going to go over some of the points in these readings, but we're not going to do that extensively. So these two right here that you had for today, we had the right to disrupt free speech on campus. It doesn't exist. If you look at the article, so notice he's actually for free speech. So when he defines what fighting words are, he's literally going through all the times that it has been argued and used and defended against in court. And so when he brings up fighting words to begin with, he's trying to point out a problem that sure, it was used the first time in court, but then if you look at every other time since then, it's actually been kicked out. He is arguing that fighting words isn't really a thing. So when he says, are these fighting words? Unquestionably so. This means if that other thing was fighting words, then this would definitely be fighting words. And yet the Supreme Court kicks it out. This article on Shouting Fire does a similar thing. All it does is just focus on the ways that people have used Shouting Fire to try and argue cases. It's important to differentiate between fighting words and shouting fire. What's the significance of shouting fire in a crowded theater? Um, causes panic, causes unnecessary. Unnecessary what? Uh, people get trampled because- There we go. He started, yeah, he started a, uh, a stampede. Right, who started it? The person who shouted fire. Yeah, that never happened though. Right. That was just a- uh, uh, Example, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it was an example brought up by yeah. a, a judge so when your words can cause a physical and measurable harm to other people, that's when you can be penalized for it. When your words can be equivocated with shouting fire in a crowded theater, 
the idea that with your very words, you have caused harm to happen to other people. And it can be quantified in a way where you can get sued, where you can have punitive damages, where you, you have to pay fines or spend prison time. So if you shout fire in a crowded theater, but there is fire, I mean, you're, you're helping people in one way. I mean, there's a better way to do that. I mean, pulling a fire alarm can do the same thing. And that's why kids get in trouble for pulling fire alarms, because you could incur injury to others. Now, if you don't incur injury, then how can you sue someone for that thing? There has to be an injury that occurs, but you could still get a fine for something. Kids still get detention or suspended from school. But what's the difference between fighting words and shouting fire. We get a really good explanation of shouting fire on the second page. The message fire is directed not to the mind and the conscience of the listener, but rather to his adrenaline and his feet. It is a stimulus to immediate action, not thoughtful reflection. So when you say something, when your words can actually cause someone to respond without thinking, that's shouting fire. That's like yelling, you've got a black widow on your shoulder or, or on your forehead. What would you do if someone told you you have a black widow on your, on your head? Like a knee jerk reaction would happen, right? You'd either hit yourself in the head or you'd like go like that and mess up your perfectly groomed hair, which none of us have, so I mean. <laughs> really irrelevant to us but you get the point right it's something that causes you to move without thinking now fighting words this all goes back to fighting words right fighting words is trying to say that there are words that you can say that will cause this to happen but in a way where someone punches not themselves in the face to get the spider off but it causes someone to punch you in the face do you guys think that that's possible? Like that that's a thing that can happen where there's some kind of words that someone could say to you where you responding to them by punching them in the face could be justifiable? Yeah, I would say. By law. Okay, what could someone say to you that would cause you to punch them in the face and you could justify that legally? Mm, yeah, like if someone tells me, I'm going to punch you. I might just punch him before he punches me, let's say. Okay. Is it a true threat? Is someone threatening you now? Because threatening is not protected by the law. But if someone says something insulting, like hate speech, is there any mm. kind of hate speech? Because this is what we're talking about here. Do you censor? Do you make hate speech illegal because you are claiming that it is fighting words? Is there something that is hateful speech that someone can say to you that you think could justify physical attack? Because right now, physically attacking someone is not legal. Now there is defense. So like if someone says they're going to attack you and they have a knife in their hand or a gun, well, that's brandishing a weapon and threatening you. That's a true threat. And so that's not protected. And so your defense will be justified. But we already have laws in place to to protect you in that scenario mm -hmm. to then to try and make a law where we justify physically attacking someone because they said something that pisses us off that's the thing that would be the argument here so do you want the government to jump in and do that stuff for you or can you control yourself is what we're, we're dealing with here and if it comes down to you having to control other people i mean that can get flipped around on you pretty quick it all depends on what is popular at that time. And 60, 70 years ago, what was popular at the time was segregation. Like hate speech would have been black people should be able to use the same toilets as white people. You, you, you get that? So if we, if we didn't allow that kind of hateful speech back then, would the civil rights movement have even been possible? arguments of shouting fire or fighting words, you, you kind of got to understand what the guy is talking about here. So if you want to argue 
for free speech, but you're fighting against someone who's actually trying to prove it, that's, that's a problem, right? You're, you're misunderstanding the person's argument because it's, it's a little bit more complicated than what you're making it out to be. So yeah, this guy, he points out how fighting words has been used in the past, but then he shows how in every other case since then, that has been more of a case of if you wanted to say something was fighting words, still didn't qualify as fighting words because we realized that it actually ends up making a bigger problem for free speech. The argument for fighting words is pretty much like being an abusive husband and saying you hit your wife because she forced you to. Whoa. Think about that. Your wife did or said something that made you so angry that you could not help but beating her. You know that that's bullshit, right? So why would you say that fighting words should hold up in any other circumstance? A good argument would also be the uh, over in France, the prophet uh, cartoons. Yeah. yeah, that's a huge thing right now. You've <laughs> got the prophet being represented in a mocking way. Mm -hmm. And you've got a, a faith that has a belief where this is so sacred mm -hmm. that the prophet is so sacred that you can't even draw him. Right. In all Muslim art. His face has to be covered. Even in, in all yeah. Muslim art, it's just, it's writing. That's why there's right. so much emphasis on the geometry and the structure of buildings mm -hmm. and, and having writing in it, but mm -hmm. there's not, there's no pictures. Mm -hmm. Like you're not supposed to have any pictures of, of religious things, especially of the prophet. So, mm -hmm. so when you see how revered that is, you can see why people would get upset, but does someone drawing a mocking picture, completely inflammatory and everything like that, is that enough to then go and murder a whole newspaper? Or, by the way, just like last week, did you bring this up because of what happened? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, the beheading, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. A teacher is just going over this stuff in his class, in his like elementary school or middle school class. And someone hears about it and they decapitate him in the street in France. This happened in France like last week. So that's still an issue. Does that justify? Because the argument there would be this is fighting words, mm -hmm. right? right? So there's quite a bit in the shouting fire reading, but you probably wouldn't argue against this one. You would probably take concepts from it and make them your own argument. You don't need to quote this. This guy's just making reasoning. You know, he's, or he might be pointing you to what maybe a Supreme Court justice said, right? And maybe you, you could find the quote from that Supreme Court justice and use it on your own, but you don't actually need to use this as a source. But it is something good for concepts. So the right to disrupt free speech on campus, you need to be able to define what you think are fighting words if you think we should be able to justify them. Like in your essay, either say how you can define them and how that means you can regulate them or you should be able to regulate them or explain how it's impossible to define them or to justify them, and then build a whole argument about how it is right or wrong to do either of those, or to want to enforce or not enforce, whatever. So, so then with uh, the next one, should neo-Nazis be allowed free speech? Because it has the strongest points in it, if you are for free speech, this is the article that people typically go with to argue against. So he goes over some significant points about how emotional and physical injury are equal and should be treated the same. He claims that through brain scans and controlled studies with participants who were subjected to both physical and emotional pain, that emotional harm is equal in intensity to that experienced by the body and is even more long lasting and traumatic, right? That's a claim of fact and that is meant to support his argument for why hate speech should be banned because people can suffer emotional pain that is just as strong as physical pain. What's the difference between physical pain and emotional pain here? So let's say you get hit by a car. You're walking across the street and a car just like drives through you. It shatters your femur and all the bones in your leg and your hip. Um, it can be argued almost that, you know, emotional pain can be, you know, healed and through like therapy and 
and it can, and recurring like it, when it reoccurs more, it could be less severe. But physical pain, once you break completely destroy a bone, like the, that's no longer there. So let's just say it's a clean break, mm-hmm. just on the femur. But they we have technology now, and they just bolt that thing together, and you mm-hmm. can walk on it in like a week, you know, yeah. or or even right away. Now let's say you heal from that. But but what about something where someone has insulted you in such a way mm-hmm. where you you do have trauma or or maybe you had an experience and it was you know involving things that people said to you maybe it's a, a who, whoever like someone who you care about what they said or or not see that's the thing mm-hmm. does it hurt so much when you don't know when you don't know the person or don't give a crap about what they think mm-hmm. does it hurt as bad no. Yeah, it's kind of hard to say that it does hurt so much because mostly we're like, well, I don't give a shit about what you think, right? Mm. You're you're just a piece of crap or whatever, and you can pass it off. But let's say there are cases where there is emotional pain. So first of all, that's an argument right there. Mm. Like how how is it that anyone who could say that kind of stuff, but let's say maybe it's your parents or and you come out to them and you say that you're gay and then they say something super psychologically emotionally painful to you and that takes years to recover from you can kind of see how that's a thing that could be a justification of how emotional pain can last longer than physical pain but this is the thing if a truck hits you if somehow your bone breaks because of that car hitting you in the leg you can clearly make that connection but when someone says something to you that is hurtful you have the choice still to be hurt by that thing, don't you? Or do you not have the choice of how you take the thing that someone said to you? Well, I would say it depends on like how old that person was when someone told them something hurtful. Like the younger, the harder they'll be able to take it as they want it to take it. Adam, that is a really good argument, dude. <laughs> like, think about it, right? The mm. age, because now it gets a little bit more complicated. Children are not able to rationalize or, or understand things, even to the point where your parents getting a divorce and you're young. Because children are very self-centered, they mm. think it has to do with them. So if you are going to make an argument, that could be an argument that you want to either argue for or against. That's a strong argument to try and reason about how that goes down and how that would apply in this scenario. But I don't think Rosenbaum does that well enough. I think you brought in something just now that would work with this stronger. But yeah, there's all kinds of holes in this guy's arguments here where it's comparing two unlike things. But It doesn't mean that it all falls apart. There are still good arguments that you can make with what he's saying here, just like there are good arguments that you could make against it. And that's why this is one of the strong uh, papers to argue against. So those are some of the main points that should have probably been dealt with and that people maybe misunderstood in those two readings. I want you to know that in these next two readings, it's even more difficult to understand what they're saying. Either they go back and forth between the opposition in a way where where you really have to pay attention. Like this guy, this guy wrote this for like a very prestigious school. So his argument's complicated, but you really need to remember, okay, which side is he arguing for? I even color coded these so that people would know. So if it sounds like he's arguing for the other side, he's not, (laughs) right? It, It means he's trying to make a complicated argument that wrestles with the other side to disprove it. So that's a, that's a heads up for this next reading. Then what I wanted to show you is what we've got ahead. So for Tuesday, you have to read these and contribute to the Canvas group discussion number two, which is gonna be the same thing as this last one. But then once again, I'm moving the annotated bibliography to the next one. So I do suggest showing up to Saturday because that's when all the cards are on the table. You guys have fully examined the free speech thing and you're going to need by next Tuesday to have not this Tuesday, but next Tuesday to have an actual rough draft and an annotated bibliography. So next class is going to be the last one that you get where we can wrestle with these ideas as best we can. And 
for me to hear whatever you want to do with your essay and for me to either shoot you down or to point you in the right direction or to just give you the thumbs up. So I suggest being ready for that by next Saturday, but also showing up next Saturday, which you guys did. So I'm really not talking to you right now if you're in the meeting. <laughs> and then notice for the rest of the semester, like we are almost done with me forcing you to read long and annoying articles, right? Like we're almost done. There's light at the end of the tunnel. It's really not much left. The next essay is due pretty soon here, but you guys have already written some rough essays, so this shouldn't be difficult. Now you're actually able to enter into value. That's what I want you to focus on. So light at the end of the tunnel, good job. You're so close. Uh, just keep pushing. And then the below example, so some of these are things that we focused on in the past, but so much has happened in the last, just the last year, like since COVID happened. So yeah, sure, there was, you know, people banning people from speaking at colleges because they had hate speech in the things that they were talking about, blocking students from showing up on campus, asking teachers to step down because they disagreed with what they thought. Oh, Antifa members beating up KKK members before they can even go and speak publicly, literally stopping them from holding their thing. That was just in Anaheim, not even that far away. That was, all this stuff happened like around last election though. So this is like four year old stuff. The things that you wanna be looking at right now, which I would suggest taking a screenshot of this. These are some of the new possible things that you could talk about, but you may already have your own ideas. These are not ones that you have to talk about. These are just some ideas. What's going on with fake news and censorship? There's a lot of censorship going on. Is it fair? Are there possible dangers with it? Who is doing the censorship? And what does it do when we censor things so that people can't wrestle with them? And should we be teaching people how to wrestle with and how to understand like what information is coming at them? Because this is the difference between like, you know, if you control everything, then we all end up like Wally just sitting, drinking our slushies, and not having to think about anything. And so our brains get fat and lazy, just like our bodies. But then there is a danger with, yeah, what about kids? What about people who, who haven't learned? And then disseminating information, that becomes really dangerous. So this is something I definitely want you to think about. So your thesis and overall essay should touch on if we should or shouldn't do something, policy, it should touch on it, but your main criteria, reasoning, and argumentation with support, all that stuff should focus on what is right or wrong about it, or, or how the right or wrong of something outweighs the other thing. That's the value argument. So you're focusing mainly on value, but you are touching on policy because this all comes down to should we make it legal or illegal? But once again, this is your value essay. So you, you want to focus all your arguments and support and everything like that on trying to explain how it's a problem or a good thing in a right or wrong way. Make sense? Makes sense. Cool. This is actually uh, the last thing I wanted to say, which is next week, if we're in class and I ask you to start working on an outline of something and drafting something out in a brainstorm, this is close to the prompt that I'm gonna give you then. I might tweak it a bit because once again, stuff at the bottom here, these are all really old examples. I want you as you're going throughout the week to be looking at current examples of things like within 2020 of things that you can point to that would either prove or disprove what is problematic or what is okay, acceptable about what you're saying. Because if we have to force people for a cause to get through, right? If we have to literally force people into doing things. Is that acceptable? The kind of censorship and way of going about things that we, we have already been doing just very recently. Like we're talking masks, we're talking any kind of COVID information, false information coming out, or things with Black Lives Matter and protests and violence. At what point is something free speech? And at what point is it now something that's illegal? You burning down a building now is not free speech. That's arson. Think about not confusing those things. In one of the articles, they talk about the alt-right rally in Charlottesville, like years ago now, someone ran over some protesters. So th 
the rally was a protest, right? But then there are protesters on top of that. So, so when you think about the protesting of the protest and how, so when someone runs you over with their car, is that speech anymore? It's action. Yeah, it's not speech. It's a, yeah, it's a physical speech. action. It's you're attacking someone. So is that the same thing as speech? Because a lot of the arguments tend to get muddled in what they're talking about. And so I want you to be on the lookout for that. Um, is that something that you can say is speech? And does that one person who did that thing even speak for the rest of the people for that movement? Is that fair to say one example? And likewise with Black Lives Matter, do the people who are causing the violence speak for all of the people? And can you, can you bifurcate, can you remove the violence from the cause to say this one thing is good, this is a bad representation of it or vice versa, whatever. So, so be thinking about that stuff with what you want to argue and with where you want to go with your essay and finding examples. So that's, that's really all I have to say. Make sure that you finish up the reading responses and the, and the Canvas group discussions. Stay strong with those because you're going to be able to incorporate that kind of stuff, those arguments and sources that you may bring in into your essays if you do those assignments well. Anything else? That's all I got to say for, for this week. I hope you guys go through your grieving process of just no matter who we got as a president, yeah. they're, they're going to be shit, no matter what. Like, we had shitty options. We, we got two old, wrinkly white men who think they're awesome and get We had paid Kanye, money. though. Yeah. I mean, he could at least make some good music for us. In the Oval Office, the first record. Yeah. Oh, man, he'd probably put his whole mixing studio in there. That would be so far. Yeah. It probably has great acoustics, you know. Yeah, I'm assuming it's like nice circular, you know, everything comes. All right, well, you guys have a good rest of your day, and uh, and stay safe. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Professor. Thanks, Professor. Yeah. See you have next week.